Here it comes. We're live. Welcome. Welcome to the Tuesday live stream. I'm answering your questions today from the live chat. So begin. You can start putting your questions in. Put a capital Q next to your question if you'd like me to answer it. I have a couple of quick rules for you guys for tonight. Um, nothing crazy, but uh, trolls will not really be tolerated that much. And no, I'm not going to spend all my time trying to prove that you're a troll because that's just part of your trolling <laughs> for those of you that are like that. Um, trolls never think they're trolls anyways. So that's not the issue, but that doesn't mean you can't ask me a hard question or a serious question or a question I don't even know the answer to. Um, so I, I'm a pastor. I care about theology and apologetics, and I will give you the best answer I can, at least off the top of my head. That is always a limited um, spectrum of information. I'll give you the best answer I can, though, and I will uh, I will shoot straight with you and all that kind of good thing. So I'm welcome, welcoming those, those tough questions. That's fine. Um, but it's not stump the pastor. I mean, if your goal is to stump me, that I mean, that in itself is a troll thing. If your goal, however, is to get insight, information, understanding, to grow in your knowledge, uh, hear another opinion, to think about those types of things, then welcome, my friend. Glad you're joining me. All right, let me uh, let me pull out a piece of information. I got something right here. I had something right here. I wanted to. Wanted to share with you guys. Well, I got so much going on right now. This is one of the reasons why I'm doing Q and A's. Often, if I do a Q and A, it's because I'm already uh, steeped in a bunch of studies and I'm preparing for future videos and future teachings um, or even uh, you know events I'm sharing at. And so then I'm not able to prepare a lot like you know I went for the live stream. So I use that opportunity to do the Q and A to do that stuff. If you're watching this after the fact, there will eventually, like within 24 hours, we'll have a timestamp map in the video description, as well as the first comment on the video on YouTube for people who are on mobile. So you can just click and navigate to exactly the different questions you're interested in. Um, hmm, what was it I wanted to share with y'all? There was something. I'm working on a project, a secret project right now, involving several different scholars, Bible scholars. Yeah, that's right, but that's all I'm telling you. That's just started this week. I'm excited about it. And I have no other information. Thanks for joining me, you guys. I uh, appreciate you being here. Let's uh, let's let's just go to those questions as soon as we can. I should probably figure out where I left my cell phone. Ah, because this is how I get your questions. All right, here we go. This is uh, our questions coming in from our super mod AJ Bernard, who is there handling and filtering through, and only giving me the best of all the questions. He certainly doesn't just send them to me without reading them. Yeah, actually, that probably happens more often than not, especially in the beginning of the stream, because as if he had the time to read them, think them, think, th think through them all. Uh, but here we are. Okay, so first last has a question, and first last, hi, good to see you here. I recognize your screen name. I know you've been with me for a long time. Um, do you think the flood in Genesis was global or the known world at the time? Do you think it matters a great deal? Which either way, um, do you think it matters a great deal either way, or affects the intention or theology of the event? Um, good questions, really good questions. Let me start by saying I don't know what the right answers are to this question. I care about it. I've thought about it a lot. I've read different resources on it and heard different people and debates on it and that kind of thing. And me, uh, to be honest, I'm not quite sure. And, and I'll give you a couple of the reasons why, um, at least why I'm somewhat on the fence on the topic of the scope of the flood. You do not need to be on the fence. Maybe you know the right answer and I'm just the one who's ignorant here or been confused because I read too much information about it. That can happen. You can get information overload where even though the truth is in the mix, you just have read so much stuff that you don't even know what you're thinking anymore. At that point, it's nice to step back and sort of give yourself some space and time and rethink this stuff through uh, when you have the time to really methodically look at it and not just sort of consume a massive amount. That's just good advice as humans, you know. Uh, anyhow, um, there's times in the... In the, uh, in the Bible where it talks about all the land and it, it clearly doesn't mean the whole planet Earth. In fact, there's, there's times where it uses the word Earth and it clearly does not mean the planet Earth. In fact, I would say that's pretty much what it always means. Like it, it, As I look at the word Earth throughout the use of the Old Testament in context, it's very often or maybe every single time you can make a good case that it's never talking about the planet. Um, and... That doesn't mean that the Bible never addresses the whole planet, right? But when it talks about the earth and the seas, now it's the whole planet. I think the word earth more often means the dry ground. So continental areas and islands, this is earth. The way that we in the old school days would think earth, earth, earth. Um, so yeah, like 
Anyway, I can give you some more examples. It's a, a much more drawn out discussion than that. But my my thought is that um, that seeing some of these things happen, even in the book of Genesis, like at the end of Genesis, where it talks about how um, everyone was across around the whole earth, or I should say uh, throughout the whole earth, everyone was coming to Egypt during the famine. This is in the book of Genesis towards the end in the, in the time of Jacob. So the famine's coming and everyone throughout the earth comes to Egypt. Well, I mean, if we read that sort of like with our lenses on it, the way we use the word earth, we're thinking, so people in like South Africa went to Egypt, people in like Yugoslavia, people in North America. No, obviously this is not the case, but it's a term that they would use more flexibly and less universally than we would, even though in English we would naturally read it to be universal. That's a language and culture issue. So that's one of the reasons why I, I'm, I'm a little bit on the fence on the topic. Um, yeah. Now, does it affect the theology of the event? Um, not really. In my opinion, this, this is a question of the scope of the destruction. It's not about the theology of the event. You could have a, a local flood that does kill all mankind, every human dies. You could have a global flood that kills all mankind. You could have a local flood that kills all mankind with which the text is concerned. I find that a little bit harder to swallow personally, but I, I'm just saying you could, that's one possible interpretation. Then, um, but this doesn't really affect the theology that much because the theology of the flood is that God is judging man because of sin. And the, the picture of Christ is still there throughout the, the text. I, I don't, I don't, I think it's more about uh, the accuracy of the text is the, is the question, not the theology that it's teaching in that regard. Um, anyway, big, big, uh, I'm going to get a flood of comments now <laughs> because of that question. Um, Phil with skill one says, hello, Mike, have you ever heard of John G Lake ministries or Curry Blake? Um, if yes, what are your thoughts on their theology? If no, I will pay you to research them. <laughs> well, Phil, I would have, I would have moral objections to, to being paid to research a particular person's theology. Um, uh, if you want me to get on, get them on my radar, which they're not right now, what you would need to show me is how two things. One is how wide is their impact, right? And then the second thing is that nobody else is really handling their theology. That gets me going. Hey man, they're having a big impact and no one else is addressing this. That makes me very motivated to, to tackle and get into things. Um, so that those are the two things that I'll be interested to see. But, but I, I've heard of John G. Lake. I, the name rings a bell. Don't know the first thing about him. Curry Blake. Don't know the first thing about them. Don't know if they're right on or totally off. Sorry, I can't help you more. Um, let's see. Third question here. Jumping like a monkey says, can you explain the reason Jesus cursed the fig tree in Mark 11? You know, I don't know if it was a private conversation or a public conversation. Um, recently, this came up, this issue of Jesus cursing the fig. Oh, I remember. It was when I was on the live stream um, with David Wood on Act 17 Apologetics on his channel. I did a live stream with him kind of impromptu with no preparation whatsoever, which like I don't do. Um, at any rate, we did that. Now, uh, you could you could find that live stream if you like, but let me, let me just take us there today. Um, here's our software and we're looking for the, um, the fig tree. Here it is. Okay, so Mark 8, starting in verse 12. On the following day when they came from Bethany, he was hungry. And seeing in the distance a fig tree in leaf, he went to see if he could find anything on it. When he came to it, he found nothing but leaves, for it was not the season for figs. And he said to it, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard it. Now, um, in the gospel of Mark, there's these, what, what we call a Mark and sandwiches. This is, this is, well, hold on. Let me, let me come back to Mark and sandwiches in a second. This is exciting. I'm, I'm teaching through this in my verse by verse study through the gospel of Mark. We'll talk about this again when I get there in Mark 11. Uh, but let me just just say these are connected stories. The next thing that happens is Jesus goes to the temple and he finds them, uh, you know, selling, basically making merchandise instead of worshiping and prayer. That, that that's what the focus is. And so he rips into them. He really, really makes a big deal about it. Uh, the next thing that happens, verse 20 in Mark 11 is, as they passed by in the morning, they saw the fig tree withered away to its roots. And Peter remembered and said to him, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you was, that you cursed has withered. And Jesus answered them, have faith in God. Truly, I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes uh, that what he says will come to pass. It will be done for him. Therefore, I tell you, and, he, and he, it turns into a, a teaching on prayer. Um, now, the question is, is the fig tree only a teaching on prayer? Is that what Mark is giving us? Uh, that it's only a teaching about prayer? Hey, you can curse fig trees. 
Um, I don't think so. I think that the Mark and Sandwich thing, which is a, that's a well-established thing that happens in the Gospel of Mark. Mark and Sandwiches are where Mark, uh, in the Gospel, he starts a story. Then the story feels like it's interrupted with another story or, or a saying or something that seems disconnected. Then it finishes the story. And usually that thing in the middle is put there intentionally in order to be like a theological hint or to give you basically context so you interpret the story correctly. What's happening in the Gospel of Mark right here is we're finding that Jesus, he goes to um, the tree and there's no fruit on it, so he curses it. He comes to the temple and there's no fruit in the temple. He overturns the tables. With the fig tree, it stands as a symbol of the fact that Israel should be bearing fruit, receiving their Messiah, showing the fruit of the, of the word of God in their lives, but they've been doing their own thing. They've been living their own way. They haven't been uh, seeking the Lord first. And so then when he comes back, just like with the fig tree, as later when they come back, it's going to be decimated. And the temple ended up being destroyed in 70 AD. That's my short version. Uh, the fig tree relates to Israel. And while their destruction is, is um, complete, in a sense, in 70 AD, it's not permanent. We have prophecy in several places in the New Testament that they will one day be restored, and I rejoice in that. But I do think the fig tree is related to that. Um, yeah, this picture of Israel, not ready for Jesus when he comes. And so he gives this illustration. Um, let's look at the next question. Jay Shai says, uh, what do you think being born of water means in John 3, 5? Well, that's a, that's a bit of a tough one, to be honest. Jay, I... In John 3, 5, I'm inclined to think being born of water, I, I think there's two, I'll put it this way, there's say two options that I would lean towards. Um, my own personal private study of the passage, what I what I came to, I'll bring it up for you guys to see, um, is, is something that I felt like made sense in the passage, it made a lot of sense, um, but I'm not sure if I got that quite right or not. So I'm just going to put it out here for you guys. John 3, 5 says, Jesus answered, truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born of water and the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Um, now, though, there are some who would say, well, well, this born of water thing, this is talking um, about being baptized and you can't be, you can't be saved unless you're baptized. And they will use this verse as evidence of that. Um, I'm opposed to that view. I think that, in fact, I have teaching online about does bapt is water baptism required to save us. I did a whole debate on the topic, a big four, I'm not kidding, four hours, I think it is, of debate. Me and a friend of mine, Dean, uh, we, we went, oh, me, Dean Meadows, we went over this topic in great detail. Um, so, no, I don't think that's the case. We have clear examples in the book of Acts of, like, Cornelius. This guy was absolutely saved before he was baptized. Absolutely, he's speaking in tongues. They t they say that they that salvation has come to the people and the Holy Spirit filled them before they were baptized. Um, we have examples throughout the text of Scripture of people who are saved without being baptized. So then, what is this about? Well, my initial inclination after studying it uh, years ago was to think that born of water was referring to the the water birth, like our initial birth is born in water. We're we're babies in in, in not literal H two O, but in the water sack we call it, right? Amniotic fluid. And so uh, that's the idea, born of water. So you have to be born twice. Jesus' whole point to Nicodemus is you need to be born twice, right? He, he reiterates this in verse six, that which is born of flesh is flesh. That would be the water birth. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. And you can go on and you can see there's two births, not, not three. It's not born of flesh, born of water, born of spirit. That's three births. That, so that was my initial interpretation of this passage. Now, I have read some commentaries that their Greek is way beyond me um, that recommend that, no, no, you can't really interpret the Greek to think born of water and the spirit is two different things. That with Jesus, is, the Greek structure here is saying that born of water and spirit is the same birth. That's one thing. So whatever born of water is, born of spirit is the same thing. Now, then my interpretation would be um, that we're talking about not just physical baptism, Right, but the thing that baptism represents. And I think this is consistent in other places in the New Testament which, where it talks about how we're saved and it mentions our baptism. We're baptized into Christ's death. Now, I think that you could be baptized in that spiritual sense whether or not you've had the water baptism. You could even have a water baptism whether or not you've had that real spiritual change. And so that the water becomes like an outward uh, expression of it but not, not, is not necessary for salvation. And I think that marries all of those scriptures together, even if you do take a water, um, represents water baptism view of this passage. 
Um, anyway, I think that probably a more careful explanation of it would be in order, but that's this is my Q&A version of everything. So. so there's two possible interpretations and how I would reconcile them with my understanding that baptism is not required for salvation. Read about Cornelius if you, if you struggle with this. Cornelius, absolutely saved, definitely not baptized at the time. Um, so yeah, there, there's something for you to think about. Let's see what else we got here. Katie O'Brien. Let me take us back to our home screen so you can look at my guitar in the background. Uh, Katie O'Brien says, is Romans 120 a good verse to help refute the belief of total depravity? Hmm. There's lots of lots of uh, landmines being thrown at me today. <laughs> and I think you guys should just take these answers as my thoughts. You process these things. You should not simply believe it because I said that that's what I think it means. You should, you know, consider it, process it. Romans 1.20, for his invisible attributes, namely, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly perceived ever since the creation of the world in the things that have been made so that they are without excuse. Um, I think, Katie, that while I do disagree with the Calvinist formulation of total depravity, which I would more want to say is total inability, as in inability to even respond even with the work of the Holy Spirit, not having regenerated you, but having called you to God, the Holy Spirit's calling you to God, and you you don't even have the ability to say yes to the Lord. Like that would be total total depravity or total inability. I don't agree with that. But I don't think Romans one twenty relates to this concept, at least not in my mind. Like I'm just reading it now, thinking your, about your question. I don't see how this relates to total depravity. It's simply saying, hey, everyone knows that God exists or at least has received sufficient knowledge to be aware that God exists, whether they're currently knowledgeable of it is a different issue, but they've received sort of the um, culpable knowledge, culpable revelation, put it that way. There's enough evidence out there showing God exists that everyone's without excuse regarding his existence. All right, let's move on to the next one. Uh, Misty Hendricks says, how do you love God more? Um, well, I, that's a great question, Misty. I think... There's probably a lot of good answers to this question. The first thing that comes to my mind is where Jesus says, if you love me, obey my commands. So that walking in obedience is a way of loving God. And when as Christians we realize this is really beautiful. My obedience is love. Like it's all about love. This whole thing's supposed to be about love. That my my simple obedience to Christ is an act of love to him. He says, if you love me, obey my commands. That's one way to love him. Another way to love him is prioritizing. Uh, that is to say, we, we make sure he is more important than anything else in our lives, either our own life or anyone or anything else in our life. This doesn't ever amount to mistreating people. It amounts to our, our highest allegiances to Christ. And given a conflict between you know, following Jesus and somebody else, we always pick Jesus. So that priority of Christ is another way to love him. And this is how he uses the term, um, I think, when he says, um, if anyone you know, wants to come after me, he's got to hate his father and mother. He doesn't really mean to hate like what we probably think of. What he's saying is it's a selection term. It's like, I will choose Christ over even them, over even them if, if that conflict arises. So there's a couple of things, Misty. Um, obviously, you could delight in his word. Um, the scripture talks about delighting in his word. So you're, you're, you're prioritizing the spiritual things, that sort of thing. Let's see here. Gutrog02 says, I feel the enemy attacking me as if trying to make me fail or fall. Please help me. What can I do or verses to read? Oh, wow. Gutrog, I pray God gives me some wisdom to share with you, brother. Um, what verses to read as you're going through a time of feeling like you're attacked by the enemy? I mean, one of the things that I think of is the book of Galatians. I know that it may not seem like a spiritual warfare kind of a text, but it seems like it to me. Um, he talks about in Galatians about the victory we have over the flesh, um, how we're crucified with Christ. You see, the enemy can attack you in a couple different ways, but I think his his biggest victories in our life are getting you to sin, getting you to yield to sin and ungodliness. I think those are the biggest victories because those are the things that cause an internal issue, not just an external issue. And you can find victory in that uh, as you read Galatians, talk about walking in the spirit versus the flesh. I think that's one of the things you can do. I think that praying and fasting is also really wise. Going through spiritual issues. There was a time where the disciples had trouble casting out a demon and Jesus says this kind of only comes out by prayer and fasting. I think that the implication here for us as Christians is prayer and fasting are both things that can help you go through a spiritual struggle or battle that you're experiencing. Prayer, I'm reaching out to God. Fasting, I'm putting off the flesh, the desires of the flesh, my, my uh, 
my nature's desires so that I might seek the Lord more. These are great things to do. And I think there, there might be some obvious stuff in your life that you know is causing you problems. Deal with those things primarily. So gut rock, I encourage you to do that. But rest in the power of Christ and the goodness of God and the fact that God is there with you even in your struggles. He may, he may put you in a situation that is way more than you can handle. That's true. But you can trust him even in that situation. And that's an important part of the battle is just choosing to trust God even in the midst of it. Uh, let's see here. We have a question from Dabney Langhorn. How should we reconcile the baptism verses in Acts? Acts 2.38. Okay, this is another baptism question. Let's look at a few verses here and I'll take your question and we'll try to deal with it. Um, try to figure out how I can set this all up so I don't cause a disaster, which happens on a regular basis. So the first verse is Acts 2.38. I should pull up my actual notes on baptism. Maybe I will. Let's see. Um, Peter said to them, Repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, so the baptism is is a com- is commanded is commanded. The question is is it is it um, necessary? Because all things that God commands us to do are not necessary for salvation. Con- consider that that is a, an important point. Um, but let me here. I'm just going to pull up my actual notes on this on this topic because I want to take us to a few places. Have to, ooh, I'm going to have to like look for these. Where on earth did I even put those? Hope you guys will be patient with me here. Thanks for joining me, by the way. This is the live stream. We do it every Tuesday at 5 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, or at least almost every Tuesday. And um, hmm, that's not it. All right, I have this massive file with so many different documents in it here. Um, Okay, I'm going to look for my notes on this passage in Acts 2 because I think that it would be fruitful to discuss it briefly. Um, okay. I'm, I have a document here. It's 20 pages long. I'm just scanning through to find my notes because I want this to be fruitful for you. I would like for your question to be answered in a way that blesses you. So let's see if I can find that. Yeah. Um Let me start by, I'm going to have to start by taking you to Acts 10 because that's what I can find in my notes right now. So Acts chapter 10 is where Peter encounters Cornelius. Um, Just note that it does relate to Acts 2. Um, He says, repent and be baptized. And then the result of this is they'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Okay, here's how this relates. I can't find it in my notes, but I do remember this. Um, This is how it relates to their salvation, right? When they they receive the gift of the Spirit, they're they're saved. I think if you argue with me on this, Okay, fine. But I'm pretty sure most of us would agree. Upon receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, they're saved. So Acts 2.38, Peter's like, hey, you repent and be baptized. Now, if you're going to think baptism is essential to that, then you're going to have to say that in the book of Acts, anytime someone receives the gift of the Holy Spirit, that they must be baptized first. So what I'm going to say is, while it was commanded in Acts 2.38, that doesn't mean it was absolutely essential to receiving the gift of the Holy Spirit, even though it's something God wants you to do, and it's very important. How will I build that case? Um... Let's look at Acts chapter 10. Not Acts 19. That's a whole different. All right. So here in Acts chapter 10, we have, and I'll read the story to you, right? At Caesarea, there was a man named Cornelius, a centurion of what was known as the Italian cohort, a devout man who feared God with all his household, gave alms generously to the people and prayed continually to God. About the ninth hour of the day, he saw clearly in a vision, an angel of God come in and say to him, Cornelius, And he stared at him in terror and said, What is it, Lord? And he said to him, Your prayers and your alms have ascended as a memorial before God. And now send men to Joppa and bring one Simon, who is called Peter. He's lodging with Simon the Tanner, whose house is by the sea. When the angel 
who spoke to him had departed, he called two of his servants and a devout soldier from among those who attended him. And having related everything to him, to them, he sent them to Joppa. Now, what's unique about this situation, Cornelius is the first like public Gentile figure who will, who will be obviously saved without becoming a Jew. This is really significant in the book of Acts as part of the theology of the book as a whole. He's about to be saved, right? He's already interested in the things of God. He's already interested in the things of God, right? He's alms and things like that, prayers. But he doesn't understand the way of salvation that Jesus has offered. And so, hence, go get Peter. Now, um, now let's see. The passage I want to take you to a little bit later in the same chapter is verses 43 through 48. And look at what happens later as Peter arrives. He shares the gospel with them. And here we go, verse 43 um, Peter's telling Cornelius and his crowd, Gentiles who were not baptized, they're not circumcised, none of those things. It says, to him, all the prophets bear witness that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. No mention of baptism, just belief at this point. Then, to make it more clear, while Peter was still saying these things, the Holy Spirit, who? The Holy Spirit fell on all who heard the word. Did they get baptized? No, they just they just heard, believed, and then boom, they received the Holy Spirit. And the believers from among the circumcised who had come with Peter were amazed because the gift of the Holy Spirit was poured out even on the Gentiles. And notice the commentary, it's the gift of the Holy Spirit. Remember that thing that, that in the Acts 2 passage that they received after being baptized? It was the gift of the Holy Spirit? Well, these people received it without being baptized, the gift of the Holy Spirit. He was poured out. Well, there's, in a sense, a baptism, right? Poured out. Uh, for they were hearing them speaking in tongues and extolling God. Then Peter declared, Can anyone withhold water for baptizing these people who have just received the Holy Spirit just as we have? And he commanded them to be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked him to remain for some days. You can read Acts chapter 11. It makes it even more clear that these guys literally got saved at that moment. But I think this is a great uh, way to, to explain the earlier passage in Acts 2. And um, I probably spent more time on this than I probably should have. Uh, for the sake of, I want to get to a mini questions. I don't want to just do like four questions in a live stream. So let me say that there. And there's other teaching. If you just search on Google, Mike Winger, baptism, you'll see several videos come up and you can kind of look for the ones you need there. I actually uncover this and more content in those teachings. So do you see these guys got saved, then baptized. Um, and, it, and it actually helps make sense of the Acts 2 passage. Let's move forward. Um, Nikau says, why can't we be forgiven after the after death if God's mercy is forever? Well, Nikau, I, I think that um, the question isn't how long God's mercy lasts. It's whether you have his mercy or not. So God could obviously, for, um, you know, if people die in an unbelieving state rejecting him, they, he could give them another opportunity to be saved if he chose. Uh, and some people think he does. I don't think so. I don't think there's any biblical reason to think that. Um, I'm not, you know, favorable to that view. I think he gives them their opportunities in this life and then appointed unto man wants to die and then the judgment. I think that that implies that there is, there is a permanent to our decisions after, uh, upon death. But it's not, it doesn't have to do with how long God's mercy lasts. It has to do with whether you have his mercy or not. God's mercy is forever, but do you have that mercy? Have you received that mercy through Christ? If you have, it's forever. If you haven't, you haven't. Sadly. Uh, Brandy Medved says, do you believe we can lose our salvation? Uh, Brandy, this is, a, this is a tough question for me, and I don't have a public teaching on it because I'm just not confident on my position on this issue. This is one of the several issues where I, I want to sit down at some point, maybe even in the near future, and just kind of hash through all the different relevant scriptures. There's quite a few of them. And really look at them carefully and try to figure out where I stand on this, on this topic. I do not think, though, that you, you know, if you can lose your salvation, it's because of apostasy. It's not just because you, you, oops, you blew it too much. You know, now you're unsaved. Or I'm talking about losing your salvation because you've rejected Christ. Then the, that would be, to me, where the where the discussion is. Is it apostasy or not? Um, or would you say that, like, like the Calvinist view, perseverance of the saints, that simply those who are truly Christian would never turn their back on Christ? And um, yeah, I'm not really sure exactly where I stand on that topic. Um, let's see here. Wild Hog King says, why did God permit the serpent to deceive Adam and Eve? Um, this is a, it's an interesting question. It really is. Why did God permit the serpent to deceive Adam and Eve? Well, I mean, he only deceived Eve. Adam was not deceived. Scripture tells us it was just Eve. Um, uh, but Eve chose to believe the serpent over God. That's, I mean, yeah, deceive, but 
but deceived in a way that's culpable, that has some sense of accountability there. And um, yeah, I, I mean, I don't know why I did, why God did. I, I could guess, I could guess why God did, but I feel like that's a little irresponsible to do uh, from a place I'm, you know, as this Q and A I'm doing. It's not just like an interesting theological question. It's as though you're looking for me to sort of justify the goodness of God in permitting this action. And here I want to say. Um, I think it's more appropriate to say, God, because I know who you are, I'm not going to challenge what you've done. I mean, you're the God of all creation. You're the maker of the world. You're the, the, the one who designed all things. You know all things. You are the grounding for all goodness. Of course, you have a good reason, even if I don't understand it. I think the danger is when we think that we can look at what tiny bits of information we know about isolated events in history, and we think that we can figure out why God allowed those things. Well, that... This seems to be a kind of intellectual arrogance. Uh, and, and the healthy thing for us to do is decide whether we will trust God or not. And I, of course, I'm going to trust God. I think not trusting God is, is, is literally an insane perspective. I, I think it's so... And forgive me for those who are thinking, what are you talking about? I don't trust God. I, I mean, the foundation of truth you don't trust. The one who's responsible for everything you know you don't believe. The one who created you, you don't trust. That's a really sad place to be, but it's also an irrational place to be. So yeah, I'm going to answer it that way, I'm gonna, I think. Uh, Timothy Shaju says, I'm starting Bible college in August. Any advice for me? Uh, oh, Bible college. Go for it, man. Have a great time. Uh, Timothy, make good friends. Uh, but I would say this, that here's a piece of advice. There are certain topics you'll cover that you think aren't important to you. Later on down the road, they might be important to you, whether that be original language studies or that be certain theological uh, things where you're chasing it down and you're like, I'm busy. I got a lot on my plate. I want to go hang out with my friends, but maybe it's worth doing it well. So I would say whatever you, whatever, you know, comes on your plate, do it well, would be my recommendation. Uh, you have no idea what fruit there might come afterwards. CDTV says, why do we translate Yeshua into Jesus and not Joshua? Um, so, okay. The, 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 the name Jesus is, in, in, in its more Hebrew usage, is Yeshua. But the New Testament wasn't written in Hebrew. The New Testament was written in Greek, and it's Iesu, or Iesus. And so we've got um, we've got that, and then we have Latin influences later, and then we have it going into other languages, finally into English. So it's Jesus. It's basically because we have a Greek influence, not a Hebrew influence. The same name, or at least almost the same name, Yehoshua in the Old Testament, we have translated as Joshua. But that's because the Old Testament is translated from Hebrew. So we get Joshua. If the New Testament was written in Hebrew, we would probably be saying Joshua. If you want to say it more correctly, you probably want to say Yeshua. Um, but I don't think Jesus cares. <laughs> I don't think he cares. I think the fact that he, while his family probably called him Yeshua, the fact that he inspired writers to put his name, you know, Jesus, I think that that is an implication that uh, he doesn't care about his the various pronunciations. I, I, mean, I don't care if I go to Russia and they call me Mikhail. I don't care. Um, doesn't matter to me. I'm still the same person. Yeah, if I go down to Mexico and they call me Miguel, doesn't matter to me. Lord knows. Uh, Andrew Atlin says, do women need to wear head coverings when praying or prophesying? Um, I don't think so, Andrea, but I do think that's another passage where I would love to spend um, a lot of time on it and bring like a really careful teaching on the topic. So I don't think so, in my opinion. Um, Society's Misfit says, hi, Mike, in 1 Corinthians 1, uh, 1 Corinthians 3, 3, 15 or 13, 15, I can't tell. Uh, it seems to mention even carnal Christianity could, a carnal Christian could be saved. Does this mean heaven will have some form of hierarchy between saved Christians? Um, hierarchy? I wouldn't put it that way. Although I, I wouldn't have a problem. I mean, the problem with hierarchies in concept to me, the problem with hierarchies is sin nature. When you have sinful people involved in hierarchies, you have at the bottom envy of those who are higher up and you have at the top pride and, uh, and whatever other attitudes, uh, superiority to those that are below. But if you take sin nature out of the picture, hierarchy has no issues at all. I mean, God is certainly in, in hierarchy, you know, infinitely above us, but that's not a problem at all. Uh, God is perfect. God is good. And so that's not an issue. So I wouldn't have a problem with that. On the other hand, um, I don't think we have clear indications in scripture that there are, there's a hierarchy of um, in eternity. Let me take us to the passage you mentioned. I believe it is 
chapter three. Yeah. Um, so this is speaking though. It doesn't say it's speaking of um, authority. It's speaking of reward. And for those who don't know the passage, this is talking about a judgment, not of believers so much, but a judgment of believers works or the things that we've done for Christ. And so for those who were, um, let me, uh, let me just read to you the passage. We should get the context here. Um, okay, so he's talking about the works that him and Paul have done as they share the gospel. And and Paul, I should say, Paul and Apollos have done. And Paul writes in verse 6 of 1 Corinthians 3, I planted Apollos water, but God gave the growth. So it's like the works. And now there's an analogy about planting and watering and growth. Well, he'll move on to a new analogy in a minute. He says, um, so neither he who plants nor he who waters anything, but only God who gives the growth. He who plants and he who waters are one. And each will receive his wages according to his labor. Oh, there's some kind of reward coming to Christians. It's, we're not earning our salvation, but there is a reward of some kind that's uh, coming. Um, let's see. Verse 9. For we are God's fellow workers. You are God's field, God's building. According to the grace given to me, like a skilled master builder, I laid a foundation. And someone else is building upon it. Let each one take care how he built upon it, for no one can lay a foundation other than that which is laid, which is Jesus Christ. Now, okay, now we get to the new analogy. Now, if anyone builds on the foundation with gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw, okay, just context gave us this much. The building is people who are working in blessing other believers, in evangelizing to the world. So this is about your ministry work, whether you're in technically in ministry or not. It's about the things you do for Jesus in your life to serve the body and evangelize the world. That's the work. Well, you could do work good, or you could do work bad. So he calls them these different categories, gold, silver, precious stones, wood, hay, straw. As you move down the list, it gets worse. Wood, hay, straw, like you don't want the word hay, straw. You wanna, you wanna have work that's gold, silver, precious stones. Then he says this in the future, right? Each one's work will become manifest for the day will disclose it because it will be revealed by fire and the fire will test what sort of work each one has done. Notice the fire is not purgatory. It's not testing me. It's testing my works. It's as though my works are put up on the table and someone sets them on fire. And if it's, if it's the kind of thing that can be consumed by fire, it's destroyed. And if it can't, it survives. So the fire will test the work. Verse four, 14, if the work that anyone has built on the foundation survives, he will receive a reward. There's that reward he was talking about. If anyone's work is burned up, he will suffer loss, though he himself will be saved, but only as through fire. The man gets to be saved, but he's lost everything he had in the fire. Uh, does this imply that there are carnal Christians that are that are really saved? Um, it, it would it would agree with that idea. I don't think that it's enough to teach that idea. I think that you have to go further in 1 Corinthians 3 to see that there is a discussion about them being carnally minded, carnal Christians, so to speak. So there is something of a carnal Christian who's still saved. There's a biblical case for that. Um, yeah, but I don't think that what we've read here gives a hierarchy. It only talks about rewards. Now, there is one section that I mentioned that does mention something like a hierarchy. Um, and I'll... I'll briefly mention it. Jesus talks about um, when the Son of Man comes and his kingdom with his holy angels, all this kind of thing. He talks about the parables, not the parables, but rather the, the statements about his second coming in the Gospels. And he says that um, one servant was, was, was really faithful and he'll receive like 10 cities and one five cities. And it's like, well, what does that mean? Now, this might be about the millennial state. This might not be about the eternal state. So this could be a temporary thing. But that... It's probably the closest thing that immediately immediately occurs to me that might speak of some sort of, you, I don't want to say hierarchy because there's nothing that says that, that those people are above, but rather greater responsibilities in the future kingdom. You could have that. All right. Those are my those are my thoughts. Um, I, I smile because I'm like, did people catch what I said there? There was a couple of important phrases there that would clarify mis and get rid of mis uh, misunderstandings, but we'll see how it goes. R.C. Seidler says, best way to use apologetics with your family. Um, well, I think that the, the question of apologetics with your family is really a question about relationships. Um, it's about building bridges with relationships. And I think, you know, my, for what it's worth, I'm not a pro at this, but I would recommend with your family, build relationships with those people and from those relationships, then you can slowly move towards things like apologetics. You want to build the kind of relationship where you guys can tell each other different things, disagree with each other, and still get along. I think 
is a relationship you want to build. You want to build a relationship where they don't feel threatened when you decide to teach them or talk to them about something that they don't know. You want to show that you can learn from them as well. These are all positive things. Um, so think about how to build the kind of relationship where when you do apologetics or you share truth with them, it doesn't fall on deaf ears. It's about building that relationship, I think, for family. Uh, Anthony Farina Farina says, could you explain saved by faith alone? Does that mean that if you go on sinning, you still have salvation just because you believe? Struggling with this one. Thanks, you rock. All right. Thanks, Anthony. Um, let's see. Well, saved by faith alone is, um, uh, it, it's pretty, it's, it's pretty simple. I think you already probably understand it, but it's the idea that uh, I don't do any works that contribute to my initial or ultimate salvation. I'm going to put it that way for those who are listening that perhaps have a Catholic view of these things. I don't do any works that contribute to my initial or final ultimate salvation. That would be my saved by faith alone, my understanding of it. Now, does that mean that if I go on sinning, I still have salvation just because I believe? Um, well, in a sense, it, it does. <laughs> I mean, in one sense it does, but immediately people are going to take that way past what probably is justified. Um, does that? Let me put it this way. Does that mean that if you're a believer in Christ and you fall into sin, does that mean that you still have salvation? Yes. Yes, I think it does. That's, I think, the nature of being saved by Jesus and his good works and his righteousness and not my own. That means I have peace with God, like Romans tells us. Therefore, we have peace. Having been justified by grace, we have peace with God. Oh, I have peace with him. Because it's grounded on grace and not my good works. I'm not earning my salvation. Not initially and not later on. Not at any point. Some teach you, you get salvation for free at the beginning, but you have to do good works to see it through to the end. I don't teach that. Um, on the other hand, on the other hand, I think that when you get saved, something really happens in your life. The Holy Spirit enters your life. And of course, this is going to work its way out into your life in good works. And so good works are an evidence of salvation. But that doesn't mean that I'm doing good works to maintain salvation. Seeing good works as evidence of salvation is not the same as, as doing them to maintain or obtain salvation. So if you see a Christian who's just living in total sin, recklessly careless about the, the, the righteous living that God's called us to, I don't think you're sinning so much, therefore you're not really saved um, because of your sins. I would think maybe you're doing those sins because you've never been saved. Maybe that this is the case. Now, be careful about when you would say that about someone. I don't know when to say that. I don't really know people's hearts. But in the hypothetical scenario, that would be my concern is perhaps salvation hasn't happened and the sin is a symptom of it. But I'm not saying that the sins undo the salvation. That's a different view altogether. Let's see. Leslie Johnson says, um, what's the difference between a false teacher and someone whose interpretation you don't agree with? Oh, well, hmm. Um, that's a challenging one in one sense, but there's, there's, we can make it real simple, right? A false, I, you know, when I always be like false teacher, I'm thinking there's like essential elements of the Christian faith that they're teaching wrongly. So they're like, say Jesus is a, a created being and he's just a man who was deified later at some point in his life. All right. False teacher, right? That's definitely it. Now arguments over say inerrancy. Uh, how, how do we view inerrancy? I don't think that's a false teacher thing where I'm going to shake my finger and say away, away from me, you know, get out of here. Um, I think that that's an important issue, but I don't think that that is essential to the Christian faith. So I would save the phrase false teacher for someone who's teaching like rank heresy or teaching untrue things about essential Christian truths. And then the secondary issues would be more in the realm of in-house debate. And I wouldn't probably call them a false teacher. Um, yeah, sometimes the line gets blurry in certain issues. I admit that, but that's my general view. Joseph Brandenburg says, uh, what's Mike's opinion on nudity in art? I had a disagreement with a friend about this and would like a third opinion. I have given some thought to this because um, I encountered other believers, godly men, who definitely didn't agree with me on this opinion. And they thought it's, it's, it's art, so it's okay. Uh, when I asked them to explain what they meant by so it's okay, like because it's art, um, I never got a good answer. When I asked people to explain to me, because I'm opposed to it, right? When I asked them to explain to me, um, is it okay for a woman to just take off her clothes and stand in front of you? Is that all right? How about a man takes off all his clothes and just stands in front of you? Is that okay? And they would be like, no, of course not. That's not appropriate. And I said, okay, but what if I make a, 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 a really bad drawing of them, a lewd drawing and it's just, it's, it's a bad artwork. No, that's not okay. What if I make a really good drawing, man? It's like so skilled. 
It's so good. The art is so good, but it's the same thing. It's just lewd, you know, artwork. Well, well, then it's art. And, and I'm like, well, this seems to me, um, this is what Rome did. This is what Las Vegas does. They take sin and they dress it up as beautifully as possible. I think that um, there are very few appropriate contexts for for nudity. And I think it has to do with me- when people are having medical issues, um, people are taking care of loved ones or someone who, who you have, you know, you have to... Uh, them take care of them that sort of thing but i don't think it's for art i I think that that's inappropriate and people say well the human form is beautiful and i'd say well that's part of the issue (laughs) it's the human form is beautiful but humankind is sinful and so we protect these things we cover up these things because of honor we honor the human form by not producing this kind of artwork of it i think that that's the case Um, i might make exceptions for medical textbooks and things like that uh, appropriately but not for just art. I think that that's inappropriate. I can't think of a good justification for it. Maybe you can. I'd be interested in your thoughts in the uh, video description or in the comments, rather, if you guys think that there's this is okay. Explain why. Explain why it's okay. Why Playboy's wrong, but um, you know Michelangelo making a nude sculpture is okay. Why is it okay? Help me out. And you're wrong. All right. Uh, Wyatt Walbur- Walgreen says, I know the evidence for Jesus' resurrection is very strong, but what about the evidence for his virgin birth? Um, no, the, the evidence for the virgin birth isn't, there isn't nearly as much evidence for the virgin birth as there is for the resurrection of Christ. But here's a thought. Here's a thought. Um, uh, if we prove the central claim of Christianity, the resurrection of Jesus with massive amounts of evidence, are we going to require that every other related claim to Christian truth must be proved with that same burden of proof? That to me seems unjustified. It seems very unjustified, right? The um, the virgin birth, we, well, I, I believe it because of, because ultimately because scripture teaches it. I believe the word of God is, is inspired and therefore I think that the virgin birth really happened. That's that's my main reason for believing the virgin birth. I don't try to build a secular case. If, if there's a non-believer who's like, prove to me the virgin birth, I, I'm not, I'm like, why? What? This isn't even the central doctrine of, of the Christian faith like the resurrection is. This is what I want to talk to you about. So yeah, it's a huge, I should, I should think of how to answer this question better, but it's a huge mistake to think that we should have the same burden of proof for every single element of Christianity in, before we believe, say, any of Christianity or that, um, that say, you know, I can, I can show that the Bible's inspired, but then I have to prove the virgin birth independently of that. Yeah. My argument for the virgin birth would be the inspiration of scripture. And then I would build that argument based on prophecy, the testimony of Jesus, the resurrection of Jesus, which just does bear in on the inspiration of scripture itself and the other historical evidence uh, supporting it. I guess that would actually be kind of a strong argument. Uh, Frodo E says, hi, Mike, what's your take on Acts 4, 32 through 37? How come we don't see this in practice more in congregations today? Um, I probably can't answer why congregations do or don't do things today. Um, I'm certainly not in a position to have an opinion about churches in general. Most of us have a small sampling of churches and we assume that that represents churches all around the world when we don't really know what's going on with churches around the world. Acts 4.32, now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and soul and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own, but they had everything in common. And with great power, that the apostles were giving their testimony to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, for as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each one, each as any had need. Um, the This is the socialism passage of the, of the book of Acts. Um, I'll, I'll call it that. That's, that's how it's used. Let me give you some context. Um, for this, why I don't see this as a, as a, it's a, you can do this. Churches can do this if they want, if they want, not by compulsion, if they want, they could do it, but it is not for one. It's not about government. No government was involved. Uh, two, two, it didn't happen later. It seems it happens in this one moment in Jerusalem at this season, just in Jerusalem. But when the gospel goes out to other cities, it doesn't seem to be happening there. And I start puzzling myself as to why. Why is that? Why is it that, that it was done in Jerusalem but not in other places? What would motivate them to sell what they had? And I think the answer is this, okay? You need to get the big picture context. 
it's not like a bunch of people got saved and then they became, you know, immediately communal living as part of Christianity. So that's not what's happening here. Here's what's happening. Jews from around the world gather together for Pentecost. This is a Jewish feast that people from around the world come, meaning they're traveling and they're only on a short-term trip. Maybe it's a week, maybe it's three weeks, but it's a short-term trip. They're coming for Pentecost. So they gather for Pentecost. There they are. At Pentecost, they get saved. They see the Holy Spirit uh, working in the lives of the apostles. They receive the gospel of Christ. They get saved. And what's next? They've just barely, they're baby Christians and they don't want to leave. They want to sit at the apostles' feet and learn. So how do they stay when they have, they live in faraway places? Well, they start selling their lands. They sell their stuff and they pool their resources to become a community of new believers sitting at the apostles' feet learning. This was a great idea at the moment. This is a fantastic idea at the moment. But we don't see it as a policy. We don't see it commanded in in, um, in other places. You know, when the gospel goes to Ephesus, we don't see communal living happening there. When it goes to Corinth, we don't see it there. When it goes to Antioch, we don't see it there. Uh, we don't see any of those things. And so this is this was like a, um, a unique thing that happened for good reasons and in a wonderful way, but it was not a policy to be followed by the churches. So I, I think that, that would be why I would not expect churches today to follow this, but they could if they chose to. That would be up to them and their situations. Maybe they're in a unique situation where it would be a good idea. Um, I also had a question. I was, I, I'm going to prioritize this because my buddy Cameron sent it to me. Um, and uh, he probably, he's probably not listening to this whole Q&A, Cameron. I know, I know you're not listening to the whole Q&A, <laughs> but you might maybe. So here we are. We're almost an hour in. And uh, here's his question. He says, um, he says, Mike, answer my question during your stream about demons. The question is, what powers or abilities do they have? The powers or abilities of demons. Now, this is uh, an interesting question. It's also a bit of a, a weird question when you think about the reality that, like, we're living in this reality, right? So let me say how I would do this. Um, I would think that scripture doesn't tell us a whole lot about what they can't do. We, I don't think we see a whole lot of like demons can't do this, can't do this, can't do this. Nor do we really see verses that says demons can do this, can do that. All we see is things that they're actually doing. And then we can try to draw from those verses. You could just go gather all the verses where demons do something. And you could try to pull together, okay, well then what therefore are their abilities um, capabilities, capacities, what are they? So we see possession. I, I take demons to be um, the, the, rel basically the same thing as fallen angels. If you have a different category for these things, if you think these are different categories of beings, then your answer is going to be different than mine. But, um, but yeah, so possession, that's a possibility. There can be possession. You can even have multiple demons possessing one person. We see this in the book of, uh, of, uh, of Mark, for instance. Jesus casts out lots of demons out of this one guy. So we have demons that could possess. When they're possessing people, they could actually control people. They can control their actions. Um, they, they can influence their thinking at this point for sure. We actually have a man who's insane, who's insane in the Gospel of Mark because of the demon possession that's going on. When Jesus casts out, casts out the demon, it's then he's found in his right mind, clothed in his, in his right mind. So they can cause, doesn't mean they're the only cause of insanity, but they can trigger that. Um, I do think that they may be able to, aside from possession, that they may be able to actually affect our thought life in other ways. Um, and this is for a couple reasons. I, I, in my own life, and in a lot of people's lives, they would say that they've had thoughts that they felt were just not of them, and that they were seemed demonic in nature. Now, that's very much not my biblical argument, but that's just my practical sort of like life argument. I think that that does happen. I think we get, can get thoughts thrown at us. It doesn't mean they can read our minds. I don't have comment on that. I don't think they can read my mind, but... I don't have to read your mind to put a thought into your head. I'm just talking right now. I'm putting thoughts in your head and I don't even know where you are right now. So, you know, there's some way in which they can, you know, inspire ideas or thoughts. Um, we get this with, um, with Judas. It says that Satan had put it into Judas's heart to betray Jesus. Now, this is before, this is before Satan possessed G Judas. That's before that. He puts it into Judas's heart to betray Jesus. So Satan can do that. I think that his his minions can do it um, as well. I think that that's a, a safe thing to assume. Um, so yeah, in fact, we have in scripture it talks about doctrines of demons. Another scripture tells us there's doctrines of demons to be aware of. Well, demons wouldn't be able to communicate doctrines to people unless they could put ideas in people's heads in some fashion. So there are doctrines of demons. 
behind idol worship, it said that there are demons. Um, now, this would imply that demons somehow are inspiring or receiving the religious fervor of false religions. So that dem demonic things are going on when you have um, the worship of false gods or false worship of God, that kind of thing, which is really interesting because that means that when you enter into an environment where witchcraft or um, uh, new age practices or false religions are going on, cult gatherings are going on, you know, weird, you know, sage worship is going on and, and you enter into those environments, it's not as though it's devoid of spiritual power. Rather, the spiritual power is simply not God. It's demonic things that are going on. And Satan disguises his, his ministers as angels of light, meaning that they do like to present themselves as a wonderful godly religion. There's a few things that I think uh, demons can do. Um, I, hope that, I hope that helps. At least get your, get your wheels turning on those issues. Um, let's see. I'll take another question from the chat here. Michael Edwards says, honest question, why can an atheist be a better person than a Christian? By the way, I'm a Christian. Um, well, um, cause humans have free will. <laughs> that would be a good reason. Um, yeah, I, humans have free will, but I, I want to add this to it is that when we say better person, we're often judging by a really skewed standard, right? Like my standard for what a good person you are has to do with how you treat me and the people I care about generally, right? It doesn't have anything to do with your inner heart. It doesn't have anything to do with whether you love God or hate God. I mean, isn't loving God kind of a big deal? It's like a bigger deal than even how you treat people. So if an atheist is rejecting the God of all creation, he's not really a great person, is he? Now, maybe I feel like he's a great person because he helped me out or he seemed like a philanthropist or he was doing a lot of good for certain people in certain situations. So he has pockets of what seems like goodness. And in those pockets, he's a lot better than some other people, even Christians in their pockets. But I just think we're not, we're not uh, capable of evaluating each other's goodness very well and, and that we end up coming up with wrong calculations because we're looking at a select pocket of issues that matter to us and ignoring other things that are much more important even to God. Let's see, question from uh, Daniel Kamasi. Would God ever ordered, uh, would God ever order a kill such as in the Old Testament? So like, like say the, the, uh, the, the slaughter of the Canaanites, the killing of the Canaanites, uh, you know, that were inhabiting the land of Israel. Would God order that to happen? I think that uh, for one re first response I'll have, and I'll share a few things about this. First response I would have is that God, you would, the onus would be on the person who says God would never do that. Right. They would have the responsibility, this major burden to prove that under no circumstances, for no reasons and for no justification, could God ever do that? That is a big burden. That is quite a burden. Um, I think that there is justified killing. Uh, I think that that's very clear. And I think it's clear in scripture. Right. I mean, God, he commands the death penalty. So in God just commanding the death penalty for certain people, if a, if a, if a slave owner beat his servant and the servant died, the slave owner gets the death penalty. That's in the scriptures. So if you think that, yeah, that's right. He should get the death penalty. You, life for life, right? You, you, you did, you did a, a murder, so you, you get the death penalty. Now, you may be opposed to the death penalty personally. Fine. I think, I think that scripture is, is showing us there's a moral, proper moral thing here, although it's a strict morality that gives you just what you deserve, which humans cannot handle in all honesty we need jesus that's the whole point drive you to christ but at least in principle the death penalty is the just deserts for a murder so god could command to kill yep and he does in lots of places in the old testament in particular uh, in the new testament jesus predicts that he's going to come and he's going to be the judge of the living and the dead uh, jesus said i'll tell you who to fear fear him who after you're dead can can destroy your soul or send your soul to hell uh, i'm trying to remember how it's worded there forgive me for you uh you uh, conditionalists, I know you're on me right now because you're like, you didn't quote that right. I'm just, I'm just forgetting the exact word for word quote. But, um, uh, but the, uh, the thing I'd say is, is yeah, so God, God can clearly in the Old Testament, at least in some circumstances, he does order, order killing. And I think he's right to do so. God is the, is, he has a right to kill. Uh, I know this sounds harsh and I don't, and, and this is this is the kind of clip I know an atheist is going to be like, ooh, I can pull that out of context and use it and make another video about Mike. I get like an atheist video a week about me, by the way. I don't know if you guys knew this. Uh, I got one just the other day. Utterly misrepresenting me, taking me out of context. It's all right, I'm used to it. 
And um, yeah, but at least they're putting me in front of their audience. <laughs> maybe, maybe the gospel will get out to one person and it'll be totally worth it. Um, so yeah, but no, I think God has a moral right. Like he, he has a right as the one who has the right to kill and to make alive. He can make life and he can kill life. That's his moral right. He can do it. No one can impeach him. He can simply decide for his own reasons that this, this person, I want, I want them to die. That's my agenda. That's my goal for whatever reason. And he, it's unimpeachable. Now, if you think that God is not good, that might scare you. But if you think God is good and holy, I don't see why this would bother you. Uh, I, I, don't, I don't see it. I don't get it. And I, I don't understand why it would be a hard time for someone. I'm not saying it isn't. I know it's a hard time for lots of people. I just, it's like I've thought about it and I, I don't understand why it's a hard time. I trust God and I believe he's holy and I believe he is so sovereign that he has a right to even kill. Now that means that if he commands someone, say an Israelite, to kill somebody else, say a Canaanite, that they're doing it on his authority, not on their own. So normally, if they just went and killed that person, that would be absolutely immoral. That would be murder. They would get the death penalty as a result. But because it's a command from God, now they have they have a responsibility to follow through with that command. So yeah, the, in principle, that's true. Now, the problem with things like the 9-11 bombers or something like that is they did not have a command from God. And so what they did was a, whole, a, a moral atrocity because it was absent a command of God. Um, all right, we'll take a couple more questions, you guys. Um, already did that one. All right, Brandy Medved has another question. Uh, speaking in tongues is something that really confuses me. Is it real? I struggle with what to believe. Well, I mean, it's absolutely real. It's, we see it happening in scripture. Um, I guess you might be asking, is it real today? Is it really happening today? I'm inclined to think yes, but I also think it's a very easy thing to fake. And so I don't know when it's real over here, when it's real over there, and I lack the wisdom to be able to just look at people and make that decision. But guess what? I don't have to. I don't have to decide those things. I do think that if, if a church engages in things like speaking in tongues, they should do so according to the restrictions of 1 Corinthians 14. I think they should carefully obey what God says on those topics. Um, but I'm absolutely open to it. And I think it can be a wonderful thing. And it can also be easily faked because you can just make noises. Um, and God, God be glorified in it. And, uh, and I, I would encourage you separate this issue into multiple categories category one what is the biblical understanding of this of this issue i'm gonna trust that category two um what about my experience with these things let's deal with that let me let me talk to god about this issue and let me deal with it that way i don't have to speak in tongues to be saved you don't have to speak in tongues at all but reconcile yourself with what the scripture is teaching on those issues uh question three uh, how do i go around figuring out who's right and who's wrong when they say they're speaking in tongues. And on that issue, I say, this isn't really your job. You don't really have to worry about it that much. Uh, they're accountable, accountable before the Lord on those issues. Unless they're in direct violation of a clear teaching in, say, 1 Corinthians 14, I wouldn't sweat it too much, and I would just uh, move forward. Theological theory has a question. How does one make sure that he does not evaluate or oh, elevate Christian thought and scholarship above God, especially in disciplines like apologetics. How do you avoid making the intellect an idol? Man, this is, I think, um, theological theory, that this is like a real serious issue. Uh, how do you avoid it? I think it helps to realize that you're just, you're just a man or you're just a woman. You're just one person. And that you're not going to ever wrap your head around everything. And that you have at the foundation of all these things that you're doing with apologetics and theology, you have the realization that in the end of the day, uh, you trust the Lord, you trust his goodness, you trust his word. And then that place of doing it uh, with Jesus as, as Lord in your heart, that's a really healthy, healthy thing. There are those who in, in this realm of theology and apologetic stuff, they almost, it feels like some are trying to reinvent Christianity to be more palatable. Some the minority, not even the majority, right? Just some. I think that that might be an abandonment of that principle in Proverbs, like trust the Lord with all your heart, lean not on your own understanding. Um, and God give us wisdom in those things. Yeah, yeah. And don't don't take what, uh, what scholars say as, oh, well, scholars say it, therefore it must be true. I think that what we should do is we should be able to also see it with our own eyes. If, if we care about their scholarship, we should be able to like look at it in context and see the points they're making and validate those things. Um, so I, I'm sorry for my rambly answer to you. I'm trying to think of how to summarize what I think are like a bunch of different issues. So how does one make sure that they don't elevate Christian thought and scholarship above God? 
I think you just make sure that your own personal, just being a Christian, not a thinker, just a Christian, your own personal allegiance and committal to the Lord is intact at all times. And you don't think that um, apologetics is is um, going to replace your devotion to Christ on a personal level. Joshua Leclerc says, is a degree in science of religion with a specialty of apologetics worth it? I think it depends on what you're going to do with it, Joshua. Um, yeah, I think, and but I'm probably not the right, right person to ask for this. I would actually consider talking to, reaching out to like Christian academics who have had degrees and ask them, say, here's what I'm thinking. Do you think I should do this? Shoot them an email. If you're reaching out an email to guys like that, I recommend keep your email short. Long emails get less answers. Short emails get quicker, more answers. Uh, but yeah, that would be my recommendation. Depends on what you're going to do with it. Do you have, do you have an end goal in, in mind or is it just a degree or do you have like a, something to do with that degree? Uh, I guess I'm Jay says, who is the bride of Christ and the 144,000 in Revelation? Um, I think I have a video on that somewhere. I think I got a video on that. Don't I? Anyway, the 144,000, just read the chapter in context. It is Jews. There's 12,000 from each of 12 tribes. They're Jewish people. They're Jewish people. It's just that easy, right? The bride of Christ is Everybody who's ever known Christ, right? We're all part of the same bride. 144,000 are, I think, ultimately part of the bride, but they're a special group mentioned in Revelation and they're Jewish people. They're not, it's not Jehovah's Witness stuff and it's not uh, Shinchinji or whatever the, that, that uh, cult group says. Uh, Patrick Trent says, uh, do you think people should go to college to be a pastor? God bless you. I think people can go to college and it will help them, equip them to be a pastor. I don't think it's, it's necessary, um, personally. I think that pastoral ministry is about a calling and and a, and a, and a charge that, I, I, okay, I, I like for pastors, in my opinion, to be recognized by the local body where they serve. And the body looks at them and they go, wow, look, we're seeing you serve, we're seeing you minister, we're recognizing the calling of God in your life. We believe that the Lord has called you to be one of the shepherds of his people. And we're gonna we're gonna entrust uh, you with that task, we'll lay hands on you, we'll pray for you. I, I think you want the local body to be supportive. That's primary. I think the degree is a secondary but nice thing to have as it prepares you to better handle God's word, to learn from those who've gone before you and that kind of thing. Uh, I'll do one more. I'm just having fun with you guys. I know we're going a little long in the live stream, but hey, you could just click away. So um, Society's Misfit says, hey Mike, uh, in 1 Corinthians um, 3.15, it seems to mention even carnal. Oh, I already read that. All right, Ashley says, uh, I left the church because they taught King James only. And only sang the hymns, they thought that CCM was worldly and not pleasing to God. But I really liked the warm, loving people. Um, I wouldn't I wouldn't care if I went to a church that only taught from the King James. Um, because I don't think there's anything wrong with the King James. I just don't think that King James onlyism is correct. I think that's very incorrect and it's conspiratorial and it causes division in the body of Christ. I wouldn't leave a church probably because they teach from the King James. Um, but that doesn't mean you didn't have a lot of other things going on. I'll bet you have a long story, Ashley, that's pretty complicated to really explain it all. And hopefully, you know, God gave you wisdom and used the right decision. Um, yeah, so... Interesting what you shared there. I realized that there isn't actually a question in that. <laughs> so I'm, I'm not really sure what to tell you there. But I will say this. For those of you who are going to churches, here's my thought. And hopefully you're all attending fellowship. Your church isn't perfect. Your church has issues. The leaders in your church have issues. You have issues. Be the body of Christ. Try your best to hold together, to get along, to not find reasons to cut each other off, to forgive and get along and pray for compassion for those you feel bitter towards. I mean, real, really, stop and pray every time you're bitter. Pray, Lord, help me have compassion for that person. Help me love them the way you love them. I don't think churches can survive without forgiveness being just passed around all the time. And I don't think you and can survive in fellowship with other believers without grace and forgiveness being passed around a lot, all the time. So I encourage you, please, don't be quick to, to leave your church unless it's rank heresy. Don't be quick to leave a church. Be slow, be thoughtful, be patient, be committed to one another as the body of Christ and take each other with your bumps and your warts and try to, try to make it work as best as you possibly can. And one of the goals of my ministry was this, that in, with my Bible teaching that goes on online, that churches where you, you attend a church, you love the people, you fellowship wonderfully, but you feel like the teaching is just a little bit milky or a little bit weak. Here's a resource that will help bolster the teaching that you need. And you can still be involved in that church and fellowship there. And maybe in the future, 
you're equipped to be the teacher who helps bring better meat. God willing. All right. Brandon Gudo says, uh, what good apologetic books do you recommend? It totally depends on the topic, Brandon. Um, uh, if it's like evidence for God, stuff like that, um, I think that uh, On Guard um, is, is a very accessible apologetics book. If you want a more scholarly, harder version to read, you could get Reasonable Faith. This is the same book, effectively. William Lane Craig, he wrote both. So On Guard is a great one if it's about evidence for God and for the resurrection of Christ. Um, but it's more of a short case for that. If you're looking for, um, is Christianity true? If that's like, you're just, is Christianity true? And like, kind of walk me through all the major arguments. And I think the case for Christ by Lee Strobel is one of the best books out there. It was the first real apologetic book I ever read and didn't even know those kinds of things really existed. And I thought it was fantastically done. Um, and still it stands the test of time. I think, uh, there's a couple places to start. Now, if you're looking for other stuff, that's like more, um, focused, um, I don't really know. It depends on what your focus is. <laughs> yeah. Let's see here. Um, Emmanuel uh, says, my Christian friend says we should not offend people when we share the gospel. My understanding, they must get offended in order to be convicted for their need of Jesus. Your thoughts. Um, Emmanuel, I'd be between the two of you guys. I would think they don't have to be offended, but I can't avoid offending at least a portion of them. So I would say their offense doesn't factor into me sharing the gospel. Maybe they get offended. Maybe they don't. That doesn't factor in. I don't want to create an offense with my attitude. I don't want to create an offense with my bad behavior. But if the gospel itself is offensive, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm going to share the truth of Christ unaltered and we'll see what happens. And I think that that's what Jesus did. I think some people were offended by him. Some people weren't. And he put it on them. They're offended because they're responding to the truth of God. And I think that would be a wise way to do it. Um, yeah, don't focus on how offended people are. Don't don't validate your ministry because people are so offended. Oh, I must be doing it right. Or because people aren't offended. Oh, they're not offended. I must be doing it right. This is this is unwise. Uh, we have to evaluate our ministry based on, based on faithfulness to what God has called us to teach. All right, we're going to come to a close pretty quick here. But Ryan Jennings says, Hi, Mike. Thank you so much for all you do. What can you share about the old earth, young earth topic of discussion? I've been listening to a lot of Ken Ham, but I would love to hear from you. Oh, Ryan, um, I'll share with you a few of my thoughts. And can I, can I say this? This is not what I'm teaching on the topic, but here's a couple, because I don't know really for sure what the right answer is on this issue. Uh, it's another one of those issues. I, I'd love to get into it in a lot more detail. And I, I should mention this. I've said it before, but I'll mention it again in other videos. Um, I have all sorts of theology things I've thought over the years, right? But in my public teaching, I'm trying to put like a little, um, a buffer between everything I believe and everything I teach. Here's everything I believe and think. But the buffer is, have I vetted those beliefs? Have I checked those beliefs to make sure that I'm right in the text of scripture, at least to the best of my ability? And in several topics, I haven't gone through that vetting process to my own satisfaction. So I don't want to be teaching publicly on those topics. One of them is this topic um, of uh, Genesis, the age of the earth, that sort of thing. So I don't want to offer to you my public teaching on these issues. Um, so when it comes to the age of the earth, what I'll say is there's a bunch of different issues related to this and it's very complicated. And I'd encourage you to be very patient. And initially you might think, okay, here's Ken Ham over here. Here's Hugh Ross over here. I just have to pick which one I'm going to believe and go with that guy. I'm going to say the topic's actually a lot more complicated than that. I'd recommend you be very patient. Don't rush to conclusions. And, um, Hold fast to your trust in the in the trustworthiness of scriptures and all that. This isn't a question to me. The question is simply, am I understanding this text rightly? Because everyone's dug their trenches and you're entering into the war zone <laughs> where they've all dug their trenches and they're all telling you, jump in my trench. And my thought is, let me be patient. That's all I got for you on that, Ryan. Razi Ragusi says, what is your take on Christians doing yoga? Um, I think... Here's my short answer. If you're simply doing stretches and things that are healthy, that's fine. If you're involving weird spiritual elements, that's weird. Um, and you should stop. Uh, that would be my, my short answer on Christians doing yoga. Yeah. Misty Hendricks says, uh, how do we know if Joseph Smith was wrong theologically, but the Book of Mormon is right? Because I see more contradictions within the DNC and not really in the Book of Mormon. Oh, um, the Book of Mormon is... It, you know, first thing you do as a Christian when you want to evaluate the theology of Mormonism is you open the Book of Mormon and you start reading it. And it takes a while 
and you realize this isn't even about theology. Like the Book of Mormon is a long, long, long story. That's what it is. It's just a long story, but it doesn't really get into theology. The theology of Mormonism is more in the Doctrine and Covenants or the Book of Abraham, that kind of thing. If you want to know what they what they really believe, you got to go to those other books. So the Book of Mormon doesn't have this theology that's contradicting the plain teachings of scripture. It doesn't so much have that. It has a long made up story about a bunch of things that happened supposedly in the in the the area of uh, North or South America, depending. And um, yeah, it's just a long story. So there's not a lot of these contradictions to look for in the Book of Mormon. It's just not the place you're going to look, nor is there the theology. Yeah, that, so that makes sense. That's why. Now, is the Book of Mormon right? N uh, no, it's not right. Um, it, it has tons of statements about archaeology and history and about whole civilizations and massive wars. It talks about horses existing in, in the Americas before they existed historically in the Americas. It talks about Native Americans having weapons and certain uh, materials that we know they didn't possess at the time. So it has historically inaccurate statements. It, we can't find a single river, mountain, hill, um, valley plateau nation people group that the book of mormon teaches about whereas with the bible we can find all we, we can find ancient hittites from the old testament times but we can't find a single thing from the book of mormon to validate its its claims so yeah it's definitely you can check it check it against its archaeology and historical claims don't check its theology because there's not much theology there to check all right well we're gonna we're gonna wrap it up and i'm gonna answer uh, the last one card master six nine says where's your church my church is uh the one, church where i attend and where i'm one of the pastors there i'm not the senior pastor there um, but i teach a sunday evening service there you're all invited to come 5 p.m on sundays in uh, uh at 16523 bellflower boulevard because our church has more than one building so we're at the 16523 building and we go, you go upstairs and there you can meet me, and shake my hand and see my, my group of like 20 people that we get together every Sunday night. And that's where I teach my service. Um, so this is in Bellflower, California. Yeah. 16523 Bellflower Boulevard, Bellflower, California. All right. That's all I got for you guys. Thank you so much for joining me. Thanks to my mods for helping out. I pray that you had some answers that helped your heart, helped your mind, uh, helped you draw closer in some sense to Jesus Christ. And I thank you very much for being with me. And, uh, next week, we'll keep going. Um, also in the Mark series. I'm continuing doing the Mark series, and I should just, I'll announce now, as we're going through the Gospel of Mark, I, I'm doing pretty much one video a week for the most part, except for weeks where I can't, and uh, as we're, we just finished Mark 8, we're in Mark 9 now, as we continue through Mark, we're going to get to the passage on marriage and divorce, and I'm going to do a whole teaching on marriage and divorce. As we continue to go through Mark, when we hit Mark 16, I'm going to do a teaching on Mark 16, and should that be in the text of our Bible in the first place, I'm, I'm going to do... A thorough teaching on these topics so those of you who have questions like that you can anticipate uh, those types of things and all that that's all i got to say god bless you thanks for joining me i'll for, i'll figure out how to turn this off in a second <laughs>